Hey, everyone, this is Andy Hall. John Funk is here. I just want to say that of the Reading Funk YouTube channel. He is here. He will be here momentarily. And um, you got me for like a minute or two. I'm going to talk about some of the books that I just read since we're talking books today. Um, I just finished reading We Have Always Lived in the Castle. Um, well Worth Your Time by Shirley Jackson. Uh, it is uh, uh, this particular edition. I think I bought this at the Strand Bookstore actually a couple of years ago. And it is well worth your time. It's a short book. It's creepy book. There, there's some creepy stuff going on there. And it's it really affected. You can really get into the characters' heads. And of course, I'm not going to be doing a, a book review here about it. But it, you know, yeah, if you get a chance to pick up uh, a copy of this, there's definitely some weird psychological stuff going on there. And the book that I'm reading through right now. Oh, here's John Funk. John hey. Funk. John Funk. How you doing, brother? Pretty good. And you? I'm doing well. John Funk. For people who do not know who you are, how about you introduce yourself, talk a little bit about yourself, talk a little bit about your channel. Yeah, so I've got a channel on YouTube, Reading Funk, thinking about changing the name of it, but it'll be Reading Funk for at least a little while longer, where I read a variety of genres, fiction and nonfiction, science fiction, fantasy, Stephen King is a big one, classics, I love a lot of classics. One of the, the main themes with my channel is that I just read a bunch of different shit, including nonfiction. I'm reading The 48 Laws of Power now. So, uh, you know, I like to read books and review them. I'm doing biographies on different authors. I'm having conversations with uh, other people that read. So, you know, it's fairly small now. I'm almost at 4,000 subscribers, but I'm, I'm still pushing and waiting for a big break with that. But I enjoy doing it nonetheless. I really like your channel. I think that you present the subject matter in a very accessible way. It, you are obviously happy about what you're doing and you're engaged in the topic. Um, yeah, yeah, it's, it's definitely, if anyone who's watching this right now, definitely worth going over to Reading Funk and hitting that sub button. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, it's a project of mine. You know, it wouldn't surprise me if someone watches this that probably has their own YouTube channel. And I've tried to have like more than several different channels where I was talking about different things. But I found that to really be committed to something, you've got to be like dedicated and into the subject matter of the whole thing. And that's why I've persevered with that rating channel, although it's not a huge... Uh, thing right now is because I just like reading books and I like a, I like having an audience of people that are act actually interested in what I have to say about the books that they enjoy. So, you know, it's, it's just a fun thing for me. Even if I never got another subscriber, I'd probably continue to do it for years. Well, I think it's important to point out, and I like to say this every once in a while, is that people who do art, people who engage in either blogging or, or writing or going on YouTube and having a channel, those who stay, those who are persistent, do it because they love what they're doing and not for the paycheck. Yeah, that is true. Because if you're doing I, it for the paycheck, there's a lot of easier things to do. Right, and you, know, you might even be able to stay with something that you weren't passionate about if if the channel just erupted, like occasionally happens for some run. You know, You know, there's a lot of... You know, you can become passionate just about having a big audience, I think. But um, for the average person, you've really got to enjoy what you're doing because it takes a lot of time to script the damn video and record it and all the frustration that goes into it. Uh, but I absolutely love reading books. So I'm trying to get to the point where I have like a really professional podcast and a, like a cinematic editing you know, I'm just trying to get better. I really want to just yeah. go next level with that and get a big audience and have best-selling authors on and make a bunch of money from it. But, uh, right. you know, I uh, I like doing it uh, even if nothing were ever to come from it. So, Cool. You know, I we were talking about this before the show started. And, uh, you know, I have my personal library behind me. You have your 
yeah. books and other uh, really, you know, and I have bookshelf envy. That's what I have. I know the last time you're on the, my channel, we talked about your bookshelves, but dude, once again, just go over how awesome your bookshelves are. You know, I had a vision for this bookshelf. Furniture cost a whole hell of a lot. And I wanted to get a big old bookcase. And I thought, you know, that's going to run me thousands of dollars to do that. So I decided to build one with pine planks and bricks. And it came out well. It came out better than I had envisioned it uh, in my mind's eye. And I stained the boards and lacquered the boards and everything. And it's a pretty good sized bookcase here. You know, I can get hundreds of books on this. So. I've got a lot of compliments about it, and I'm really uh, glad about the way that it came out. I've always wanted a nice, big-ass bookcase, and I built my own. Yeah. Yeah, it looks really <laughs> sweet, dude. And it's a great background for, for your YouTube channel. Yeah, yeah. That was the whole point, actually. I wanted a nice background, and that was the excuse I needed to build myself a bookshelf. Right, right, right. So um, since the pandemic started, I've been reading a lot more. I've been yeah. doing a lot more of everything except for working or having a job, right? I'm still working, but actually leaving the house and having a job. So I was just talking before um, you came on. I was talking about the last book I, I uh, read, which is yeah. uh, We Have Always Lived in the Castle by um, Shirley Jackson. Uh, yeah. Short little book. Fun. Uh, fun in creepy kind of ways. <laughs> One of the things that I'm trying to do is read more authors. You know, one of it, it fits with my theme of just reading a bunch of different shit on my channel. And I want to read Shirley Jackson's The Haunting of Hill House because uh, so many people have said that that's one of the best ghost stories that's ever been put together. Um, so I want to read her. I actually did a video where I had to study her a little bit for what I was doing, even though I haven't read her. Uh, I was looking into that book. And I really want to get that one under my belt and get a Shirley Jackson under my belt. You know, she's a very, um, a very, not sure if prestige, prestigious author is right or not, but they've even had like, there's the Shirley Jackson Awards. It's a literary uh, award uh, convention and everything. So she's had a big impact and I really want to read one of her books. Yeah. Yeah. I think the, um, I think this is the last book that she wrote from what I recall of the, um, introduction. Um, but I definitely want to check out the, um, that other, the, the, the haunting of Hill house. That sounds pretty cool. So do you, how do you, how do you determine which books you're going to be reading? You know, Goodreads is an app. Are you familiar with the Goodreads app? I am. Yes. Talk yeah. about that for the audience. Goodreads is an app. It's a website and an app for your mobile device, um, where it's, kind of like a social network program for readers and authors. And there's a catalog of books on there. It's about every damn book you could think of is on there. And you can start to keep track of what you're reading with that. You can mark things as having read. You can mark them as want to read. Uh, and you get these kind of, you know, these categories going on. And that's one thing that I use to help me remember which books were it that I wanted to read again. I can open up Goodreads go to my want to read list, scroll back through it. So it's really a nice thing for people that like to read uh, is Goodreads. But yeah. um, it can be a challenge for me to know what I'm going to read next. Like this morning, I started four or five books before I finally got one that, that caught me, which was the 48 Laws of Power. I tried to read Different Seasons by Stephen King, got a page into it and quit. I tried to read Roots by Alex Haley got a page into it and, and quit. And that doesn't mean that I won't come back to those books and I will, and I, I will probably enjoy them, but I don't know. Sometimes with me, when I'm starting a book, I just have to just keep testing ones that are on my to be read list and one will catch me. And, and that's what I go with. That's pretty cool. So do you usually figure it out if you're not feeling it within the first page? Within the first few pages, I'll put it back. Um, you know, and I have, an idea of what I want to read. I'm ready to read The Gunslinger by Stephen King for the fourth time. I'm going wow. to be doing this comprehensive breakdown with this epic fantasy series by Stephen King. Um, and I actually just bought a book, which is the concordance to the Dark Tower series. It's an wow. alphabetical list of character names and all these different places and phenomenon that happen in the series. Um, and I've got another book on the way which is called The Road to the Dark Tower. This guy wrote uh, a book that 
just briefly, Stephen King has a huge catalog of books that he's written. And the magnum opus is the Dark Tower series. It's a seven primary book epic fantasy series, a low end series that takes place partly in our world, a world like ours, and partly in a fantasy landscape. And many of Stephen King's other works, like Salem's Lot, a book that you recently read, play a role in that Dark Tower series. Some in a minor way, some in a very major way. And it's just this huge web of information with this damn series that Stephen King wrote. Um, even other authors have taken up with this thing now. And The Road to the Dark Tower, the book that I'm waiting for, is a comprehensive breakdown of each book in the Dark Tower series and all of the different connections that happen within King's other works and even outside the works and movies and everything so that I can get everything about this damn series as I go through it uh, for the second time. Well, I've actually read the first two books three times each. The other ones I've read one time each, but uh, it's gonna be a whole thing on my channel where I'm talking about connections in the Stephen King universe and everything related to that series. So it's gonna be a lot of work, but a lot of fun. It sounds it. It sounds it. From the chat, Dr. Osiris uh, talking about Goodreads. Haven't been on the site for a long time, but it's a good site. Yeah, I haven't been on Goodreads for quite a while myself, Doctor. You know, they do a uh, challenge where you can challenge yourself to read a certain amount of books in a year. And a lot of people have fun with that. You know, it can be fun to challenge yourself with your hobbies. Um, so uh, I just recommend Goodreads. For anyone that reads, even if you just occasionally read, I think that you might find something of value with Goodreads. So, dude, tell me this, because I was watching one of your videos. Are there free books on Goodreads? There are free books on Goodreads. Um, and I've got to do more videos on my channel about how to break down Goodreads, because that video I did is actually doing very well. It's got almost a 1,000 watches in the last couple of weeks since I've recorded it, and it's continuing to get watches for the long run. But, um, yeah, there are a lot of free eBooks on Goodreads. You can download them onto your uh, tablet or phone or your computer. You can read them right on the website. Almost all of the classics are there on Goodreads. So a lot of people don't realize that you can get many, many free down downloads right there at um, the Goodreads website. Cool. So, uh, Doctor from the Doctor Osiris from the chat, um, have you heard of an author called Ben Bova? Bova? I might yeah, Ben Bova is. Um, you know, I'm going to open up the uh, the YouTube here so that I can see the chat. Sure. Whoops. Yeah, Ben Bova is a science fiction author. I've never read him. But uh, I was actually looking at some of his works on Goodreads the other day. He has a series. I remember this paperback from when I was a kid. I had contemplating reading it, reading it, but I never did. It was called Shiva in Steel by Ben Bove. I think he recently passed away. Hmm. Um, but yeah, he was a science fiction author. A lot of what I actually got criticized for calling uh, Robert Heinlein classic science fiction by an old timer the other day. Um, oh, but, <laughs> ben Bova would be on the fringe of classic science fiction at this point. All right. So, so tell me the time. So is that like the golden age of science fiction? Is that what time period are we talking about? Uh, Bova actually wrote books up until recently. Um, I, I'm not really sure, you know, I'm not big on science fiction. Well, I am now, but I'm just getting into it. I did a video on a classic science fiction book haul that I recently, uh, did I got six paperbacks, but I've read like almost no classic science fiction books. Um, I read Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. That's not really classic, though. That was more recent. So my knowledge is very limited on classic science fiction. But by the end of this year, I'll have a much uh, better idea about that whole thing. I recently just got into science fiction uh, with this series, the Revelation Space series, which is kind of like the science fiction equivalent of an epic fantasy series. Uh, and I like it, and I'm I'm now getting into science fiction. So, but I, I really, I really wouldn't be able to elaborate on classic science fiction very far because of my ignorance. So, yo, natural atheist from the chat, how does Goodreads compare to the Google Books? You know, I'm not really sure what Google Books is. I know that I have on Google Books a couple of times. I have. Um, like read an excerpt of a book, but I, I've never actually messed with the Google Books app, so I'm not sure. I'm just going to guess that Goodreads is probably the most sophisticated uh, reading app that there is. You can even scan like the barcodes of books with your phone and Goodreads recognizes them and gives you all this information about them. So there's a lot to Goodreads that I haven't uh, 
discovered yet myself. So I have to, I've watched a couple of your videos, like I said, and you refer to the Goodreads rating system. Yeah. So is that a one to five scale? That is. And you know, that's a one to five scale, which, uh, you know, I prefer to rank books on a one to 10 scale. You know, there's a little more room in there, but uh, Goodreads has a ranking scale where you can rate books. And, and then when you look a book up, some of them have had millions of ratings, like the Harry Potter series, for example. Uh, and that gives you an idea of, for example, you could actually look up the, the highest rated books on Goodreads and you'll get a list of roughly speaking, the most popular books that there ever were currently. But yeah, you can rate books on Goodreads. You can leave book reviews. A lot of people that have um, literary YouTube channels have done pretty good directing traffic from Goodreads to their YouTube channel by leaving uh, reviews and putting a link in the review to the video review. So yeah, Goodreads has uh, quite a bit going on with that. Cool. So um, I have to ask you, what's your favorite genre? Well, it would probably be improper to say Stephen King because he's just one author, but he is my favorite author. It's tough for me to call my favorite genre. You know, even though I haven't been into science fiction very long, it would be up there towards the top. Um, I would probably say just generically just to suspense books, either a political thriller or some kind of crime thing. I like books with a very fast paced plot. So mm. I'm not really mm. sure if I have a favorite genre. I'm really big on just going back and forth between them. So it's a mix up for me. Right, right, right. You know what I really like? Uh, one of the things I, I like about Stephen King is that there's a sensuousness to it. And I'm not talking about sexiness at all, although there is some sex in it, of course. I just feel like in a visceral way, I understand the characters and I'm in the world. Yeah, and that is true for many Stephen King books. You know, he's arguably the greatest author to ever pen a, a book um, because of the fact that so many of his books are uh, very vivid landscapes to explore. Um, of course, there have been some of his that I wasn't as big a fan of. I finished Joyland yesterday, wasn't a big fan of it. It was a carnival kind of thing. It was actually part of a, it was part of a series that is the Hard Case Crime novel series, uh, which isn't his series, but he's contributed to this series. The Hard Case Crime series is mysteries that have like a 1950s feel to them. Uh, well, actually, they, I think they all take place in the 1950s, maybe the very late 40s, but uh, those, you know, detective noir kind of things. But I agree with you as far as the landscape with Stephen King, especially with that Dark Tower series. That's actually my favorite story. And it's actually become a part of me. You know, a good piece, a really good piece of artwork can not only have an influence on you, it can become a part of who you are. There are times when I'm reading his books that um, I will, you know, you, you project yourself into the characters and, and um, you, you can, you can, especially since I do some writing now and again, you can, you can have these conversations with the characters or you feel like you get to know them in, on an intimate way. Yeah. Yeah, that is true. You know, I, I, um, I really like, those, the characters in that damn Dark Tower series. You know something when it comes to, to getting to know characters, not necessarily as a writer. Well, I guess it would go for either being a writer or a reader, but if you read a standalone book, you can connect with the character just fine. But, you know, there's a little something more you can do with a trilogy. And then mm -hmm. there's something that you can achieve with a long series where it's one continuous plot with the same characters going through where you really can get to know these people over thousands of pages of dialogue and mm. happenstance. Um, and I think that's one of the attractive things about the fantasy genre in particular is that it's common in fantasy for there to be a series with many books where you're following many of the same characters throughout and you get to see their entire lives unfold on the pages. Um, yeah. But, but yeah, I agree as far as, uh, it can be something special to get to know a literary character as either a writer or a reader. Yeah. You know, um, I was watching uh, one or two of your videos and you mentioned Lord of the Rings and um, what is it? The fellowship. 
yeah. of, of the ring. And you made this interesting observation that in a lot of science fiction uh, stories, you know, people who use magic are just overpowered. They're like these Mary Sues. Right. And, and, and you pointed out that, that Gandalf in that world is not an overpowered, um, you know, magic just doesn't solve all the problems. That's huge for me. You know, I recently read an epic fantasy novel. It's a massive piece. It's the first installment in a 10 massive book epic fantasy series. This one was actually over 1,200 pages. The Way of Kings by Brandon Sanderson, who would many would say is the best fantasy author uh, that's ever done it. But I like everything about this damn book, except the fact that there was a character in here, the main character, who was just a little bit too capable, if you know what I mean. It, and that can happen with the, the Dresden Files series as well, which is another one that I'm reading, which is actually an, an even worser scenario where Harry Dresden is somehow just able to pull the magic wand out and boom, every time there's a real serious problem that looks like he might not get out of it. It's magic that resolves the damn thing. And that's one of the things, that's probably the only thing that I, that I have encountered in the Dresden Files that I think should be a little bit different maybe. Right, right. Um, that, but Gandalf and the, and the Fellowship of the Ring, I liked Gandalf. You know, the Lord of the Rings is something that's new to me because I never seen the movies. I've never read the books. I read the first third of the story with the Fellowship of the Ring now. Hmm. And I like the fact that Gandalf was very limited in what he could do. He couldn't just change scenarios and he even gets captured in the fellowship of the ring it appears as though he dies in the fellowship of the ring i'm quite certain that that's not the case uh, and that he comes back later on into the story but um he was just very very limited with what he could manage and the the, the fellowship suffered a lot because he couldn't help them and i really liked the plausibility with that i thought it was great yeah yeah that's one of the things i liked about it too so you haven't so what's interesting about this is that you read a bunch of, of fantasy uh, material first, and then you came to the Lord of the Rings. And what, what I found, once again, interesting is that you're noticing how, how um, other, other authors have paid homage to, that is uh, right. yeah. to Tolkien. Yeah. Yes. You know, the Lord of the Rings is something with these modern fantasy tales, like, any one of them authors are borrowing from what Tolkien accomplished in the Lord of the Rings. And some of them are so similar as to be a, a ripoff of the Lord of the Rings. Many people have said that about the wheel of time series, that it's just too similar to the Lord of the Rings, but it doesn't seem as though there was a real predecessor to the Lord of the Rings. Everyone copies that one story to some degree. I'm curious if I could have, if I had any question that I could ask Tolkien, I would ask him, where did you get the idea for this? Because this is the most copied thing now, and, and I don't see where you got it from. So yeah. uh, it is true that uh, even with the Dark Tower series by Stephen King, the Dark Tower is a phrase that's coming up all the time in the Lord of the Rings. Literally, the series is titled after something taken from that and, and many other concepts that are directly and clearly taken from the Lord of the Rings in almost every modern high-end fantasy story. Uh, so it is true that that J.R.R. Tolkien really is the master of fantasy because of that. Yeah, yeah, true enough, true enough. Um, so the formula, right? Because there there is a a formula that you see in movies a lot of the time that that writers use, and there seems to be a a formula that a lot of writers use for literature too. And um, being aware of it, at least for me personally, does not mean I don't appreciate the story if if the, if they use the formula well. Yeah, that is true. You know, sometimes an author can get lucky and sell a book where they've just basically ripped off someone else's formula, and it's so obvious, yeah. you know. But um, I think Stephen King does well with his story because although he borrowed some things from the Lord of the Rings, it's like a completely different story. Um, yeah. And for example, the wheel of time, although I haven't read it, I've investigated the wheel of time and it, there are like a, a lot of things that are similar. It's so similar, a cast of characters, they go on this epic journey to take on the bad guy in his own homeland. It's like 
way too similar, if you will. Yeah. It's been criticized because of that. But I agree that you can borrow from something and make it your own. And, you know, it, it uh, isn't a ripoff. Right. <laughs> so I got to ask you, how many books a month do you think you read? Or how many, you know, because books come in different sizes and uh, pages. You, do, do you uh, try to have a, do you have a goal of a couple of books a month? Or is it a number of pages? How does that work out? Well, I challenge myself to read 59 books this year. Um, I'm not sure if I'll get that far. I did read 50 last year. I had some tomes in there too, but I don't really read as much as some people might think. For example, I probably read anywhere from like maybe 35 to 80 pages per day. And hmm. if, you're, if I'm consistent with that, I can get quite a few books out of the way in a period of a year, but I probably read maybe three or four books, probably anywhere between two or four books per month. So depends on the size. For example, I read A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens last month. And it just took me a few days to get through that one because of how short it was. However, it took me like probably about three and a half weeks to read Stephen King's It. Uh, and there are a lot of people that read so quickly uh, that I talk with that could probably read Stephen King's It in a day or two. But not only do I not have the time for that, because I have about maybe an hour or two at most per day to read. Uh, but yeah, I, I'm consistent with it. And I knock probably at least a few books, average books out per month. So I, I'll, I'll tell you a funny story. I was talking to uh, Dale McGowan. He's a, he's a music professor down in Georgia. He's been on the channel a number of times. And he, he talked about composing music. And at a certain level of skill, you don't hear the music in your head as you're composing it. You just compose the music. It's like you're just having some kind of deep structure, you know, deep system in your brain, just like composing the music. So I mentioned this to my girlfriend and then she said, um, well, you know, it's like people who are reading who don't hear their voice while they're reading. And I go, what? What do you mean by that? She goes, well, you know, that you know, they're, when I read, I don't hear my voice in my head. I just read. I go, I had no idea, no idea that there is a thing Call because whenever I read, I hear the voice in my head, my voice. Unfortunately, it's my voice in my head. And I guess that's a slower way of reading. And you have to my mind. I, I think I understand what she's talking about because I hear my voice in my head as well as I read. Um, and that's usually the case. But I think that occasionally, if you're lucky, you might get into to a story that's so absorbing that it's playing out even more clearly in your mind than a movie would be. Mm. Um, and if you can really get pulled into it like that, I think that it might flow so well in such a way that you just get lost and you don't even realize that, you know, you're, the words are actually being sounded out in your mind. Uh, but it's, it's kind of rare for me to get into a story that good. I've read some in my lifetime, but, um, you know, probably not very many. Right, right. Occasionally, um, if I'm lucky, I'll get a book that just becomes a part of me, but it's not often. Sure, sure, I imagine. Um, are there books that you feel like you, quote unquote, need to read? Yes, there are. For example, um, I have been curious about God throughout my life, and I know that you are as well. Of course, uh, yep. secular uh, is a theme here on your channel. And I have my own secular channel. And at one point, a couple of years ago, I thought that I had got it right. I thought that it was clear to me that materialism was correct and that there was no God or, or certainly, uh, the gods that are known to humans weren't right. And I still think that that's the case. In fact, I'm pretty damn certain that it is, but it, it's interesting in life as you go along, you can be quite damn certain of something and it's so clear to you at some point. And then later on, maybe it's not so clear and you think a different way about something. But I've recently been getting into the idea that maybe an idealist philosophy is the right one, not concerning the gods that are known to humans, because we know that those are bullshit, right? But mm -hmm. I'm curious if maybe consciousness is fundamental to the nature of reality. And I feel like I kind of need to start reading more of these philosophical books um, and 
leave the novels alone for a while because a lot of this stuff is like really important stuff, more important than a novel would be. Um, and I feel kind of obligated to want to go in that direction and read some of those, but sometimes those can be difficult reads and not convincing reads. Um, so I am trying now to commit to finding a good idealist philosophy that's not bullshit, uh, with yeah. just kind of like a minimal facts kind of approach. Uh, so yeah, maybe in that way, I feel kind of obligated to read at least a certain percentage of nonfiction so that I'm not wasting all of my time reading fairy tales, if you know what I mean. <laughs> you know, I have to tell you about philosophy. Um, there seems to be, who, who was it, Melville, who wrote Moby Dick, and you get the impression yeah. that the guy got paid by, by, the, by the letter or by the word. <laughs> and, and there are a lot, of, and I don't want to be dumping on philosophers, uh, but there seems to be a fair amount of philosophers who just can't write um, for the everyday person, who just can't make it accessible. And even though they try. That's very true. Um, you know, I uh, picked up a book by Deepak Chopra and Minaz Kafatos, uh, who's a theoretical physicist that I actually spoke to on one of my other channels. And it was an idealist philosophy, but it just wasn't very convincing to me. And it seemed like it was just hogwash. However, I think that perhaps the idea itself isn't hogwash. If I could just find an author who writes in a way that I can relate to, who I think is being honest and has an honest objective, because I think that perhaps someone like Deepak Chopra is feeding bullshit to the millions like a religious person or a religious yeah. leader would because there's a huge financial gain involved, you know, but um, that can be difficult and it can be kind of hard sometimes to find someone who's, for example, a physicist who's writing about complex topics like black holes uh, in such a way that someone who's interested in the whole thing but doesn't want to get a physics degree to, to understand the book uh, they can get ideas across that can be appreciated like someone like me. And I read a great book on black holes last year called Einstein's Monsters, The Life mm -hmm. and Times of Black Holes by the astronomer Chris M. Pei. But it is true that philosophy can be tough because of uh, the variable of who's writing it. True enough. True enough. Um, I, I remember watching one of your videos and you were saying that you were going to read a, a, a book on physics or maybe on astronomy. And um, I'm not sure who, who the author was, but um, when you talk about like this kind of idealist philosophy, I think that um, about, about consciousness being an intimate part of, of the universe. I know yeah. that there are, you know, and I'm gonna put on my, my junior philosopher's cap. I know that there are some ideas in some theories of physics that that draw a connection between and that could just be a misinterpretation of what the actual you know physicist is or, or what the model says but there's yeah. definitely the you know i point at the moon and the moon wasn't there until i pointed it kind of you know um it's out there in the zeitgeist that seems to be what quantum mechanics is telling us and when I look at things like the double slit experiment or the quantum, the delayed quantum eraser experiments, which are quite a fascinating reinvention of the double slit experiment, um, it does seem to be telling us something about the nature of reality and consciousness. Um, and it seems clear to me that it seems to support an idealist philosophy. But one of my problems, and for example, there are Quite a few physicists who think that that is the case. For example, Tom Campbell uh, is a physicist that uh, used to work with the United States Army, worked with NASA for a while. He is convinced that uh, idealism, is, idealism is right. And he's he states that that is exactly what um, quantum eraser experiments tell us, that... Mm. Particles aren't really particles. They're a wave of probability and some kind of cosmic mm -hmm. consciousness. And there are some experiments that, that lead to that. But then, of course, we have physicists who understand these things far better than I do that seem to think materialism is still right nonetheless. Yeah. So it can be a hard problem to work through. You know, I do want to uh, touch on a point that you mentioned uh, a couple of seconds ago about Deepak Chopra, uh, yeah. Chopra, whatever his name is. It's like, you know, if I feel... Or if, or if the evidence points to the fact that someone is a huckster or a shyster or a con person, 
I have a lot less tolerance for what they have to say. But if a person is is earnest in what they're doing, if they're not just in it to make a buck, um, then they might have a crazy idea, but I am far more likely to, to hear them out and, and to listen and engage with what they're doing. Yeah, that is certainly true. That's why I like Tom Campbell um, when he talks about uh, idealist philosophies. I actually have a giant book. Where did I put that? Let me grab a book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is by the physicist Tom Campbell. It's called My Big Toe or My Big Theory of Everything. And it's a massive 800 some page book about why Tom Campbell believes that consciousness is fundamental. And he goes over like 15 points that he says he realized throughout his work doing experiments in consciousness uh, and physics and everything that support that position. I tried to read this. Actually, I still have the bookmark in it. I must have made it about... Um, 40% of the way through this, and I gave up on it a few years ago. However, I think I'm going to give it another shot. Um, you know, it's really interesting because I think that we're at a time in history where we just don't really know exactly what's going on with the nature of reality, and it can be fun yeah. to speculate about what's going on. And I'm agnostic with the whole materialism, idealism thing. Uh, it seems to me like materialism does make some good points on its side, but there are some great points that can be made from the idealist perspective. You know, perhaps if uh, we were to travel a thousand years into the future or 10,000 years, if we were still here, perhaps science would have it worked out by then. It would be clear that either consciousness is at the foundation or uh, particles are at the foundation or whatever is beneath particles. But we don't know right now. Uh, and it seems that some people can be so certain and perhaps they have good reason to be, but but with me, I'm just unsure about the whole thing. Uh, Dr. Osiris from the chat, uh, I'd like to see, what was that book again? And the full title, the one that you just held up, John. Uh, this is called My Big Toe or My Big Theory of Everything by Tom Campbell. And Campbell has a channel on YouTube. He's a pretty popular guy. Um, and he does... You can look at some of his content and what he has to say, but um, about, I don't know if it was about 10 years ago or something, some very smart engineers and physicists worked a new take on the double slit experiment called the delayed quantum eraser experiment. It's a very interesting experiment. And Tom Campbell actually explains what's happening in one of his videos. It's very incredible. And it just, it's the number one thing that makes me doubt the materialistic worldview. It's an incredible experiment. Uh, and I would highly recommend that you check out Tom Campbell talking about it on his channel. But this is uh, My Big Toe, Awakening, Discover, Discovery, Inner Workings, the complete My Big Toe trilogy. It's actually a trilogy in one book. You know, when I think about a lot of different ideas, idealistic philosophy, maybe one of them, or a worldview, I always, <clears throat> I always think like, is this, is this falsifiable? How yeah. does the person making the assertion know whether or not it's true? How can they, it, can you prove it false? What data would be there to prove the assertion false? And um, that's when you get into, like for an example, right? With consciousness, uh, Descartes had this uh, substantial dualism about body being one thing and spirit doing the other thing. And so you ask yourself, well, how do these two, you know, supposed entities interact with each other. And one relatively modern theory <clears throat> was that it's like a train going on parallel tracks. You have mind and body going on a parallel track. And though they are not, the, the trains don't interact with each other directly, um, they do move uh, in accordance. And it's like, well, that's nice, but how do you prove that to be wrong? How, what's the falsifiable way? So, so that's that's usually the uh, the frustration that I have that, that I personally have when um, if 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 there isn't a way to falsify or or to prove wrong the assertion. Yeah, and that's one of the problems with where we're at in history right now. A lot of these big ideas, we just can't falsify them because we don't know enough about reality. But one of the things that I like about science, one of the best things about science, is that it's shown us that experience 
that reality, reality is counterintuitive to our experience wow. of reality. Uh, things like time dilation are these incredible facts about the system of things that we're in that just seem like they couldn't possibly be true, right? And, right. Uh, you know, science is incredible in that way. Um, you know, it's a, you're completely spot on. I'm going to grab a book that was uh, my parents, though Christian, yeah. they gave me this when I was a kid. Yes, this yeah. is the original the original edition, Carl, Carl Sagan, Cosmos. And that's one of the things that he hammers, not hammers, but he, you know, restates is that science, it shows you how your, in, your basic intuitions about the universe can be wrong. And um, that, that was very instrumental for me. You know, I actually want to read his novel. It's called um, Contact, I think. That's one of the ones I want to read this year. I've never read anything by him, but he's one of the greatest science uh, communicators and educators we've ever had as far as the general public is concerned. Um, you know, uh, he's maybe second or third only to Bill Nye, perhaps, perhaps Bill Nye has been the greatest. I actually read a Bill Nye book called Undeniable. I read it last year. It was about evolution and I thought it was a great book. I learned about a lot about the way that evolution progresses. And there are a lot of misconceptions about evolution uh, and the way that it works. And I thought that Nye did a pretty good job on that with that book. It was, it was a lot, it was a lot of fun reading that, but uh, you know, Sagan was quite a smart guy. He was an astronomer and I'd like to read some of his books, but you're right that uh, you know, our reality is just something else. And science is the best tool that we have to try to make sense of it all. Uh, but philosophy is a very powerful tool as well. And by no means has it been outdated by science. You know, they're both very important instruments as far as trying to make sense of our experience here. Yeah, no, true enough, true enough. So do, I have to ask you, what's your favorite book of all time? My favorite story of all time is the Dark Tower series by Stephen King. I think the most suspenseful single book that I've ever read was probably The Da Vinci Code by Dan Brown. Um, so I, I don't think that I have an answer for that, but uh, the one I just gave sums it up. I, I love that Dark Tower series. I just love that damn story. It's just an incredible, unique, crazy fucking thing that plays out over seven novels with other books coming into it. Um, it's just an incredible thing. I even have a tattoo here. It'd probably be hard for me to show it, but I have the Eye of the Crimson King, who is the antagonist in the Dark Tower series, tattooed on my forearm. Uh, but I really recommend that The Da Vinci Code, too. Dan Brown is a smart guy. Um, that Da Vinci Code is a very fast pace. Like I said, suspenseful books are the ones I like the most. And uh, The Da Vinci Code is second to none among the things that I've read. You know, uh, I'll say this about The Da Vinci Code. I did read it years ago when it first came out and I was horribly sick. Actually, I got off the plane in LA. I was supposed to be there for a conference sick, just like I'm in my buddy's apartment throwing up and I'm like, well, I got this book at the uh, airport and I'm going to read through that. And it, I never read through anything that was such a page turner. I'll tell you that right now. Mm. It, it, I wanted to turn pages. Yeah, you know, I was in a fucked up position when I got the Da Vinci Code. I was at Lorraine Correctional Institution in Lorraine, Ohio, which is a reception center for uh, the state penitentiary system here. And you make it sound so nice by saying it's a reception center. <laughs> yeah, that's the way it works. You've got to go. If you're arrested in the northern half of the state, you go to Lorraine from the county jail and they process you there and figure out how much of a threat you are to the system. And then they'll classify you and send you on to a parent institution from there. Um, but I was there and I got like a bunch of mud on my boots one day. I was all muddy and shit. And one of the officers there thought that I may have been trying to escape because there's a lot of mud over by the fences and everything where the walkways are concrete. And I wasn't trying to escape, but the motherfuckers put me in segregation to launch an investigation on why I looked like I might've been over in the mud by the fence. But um, I was in a room by myself for probably more than two weeks, nothing to read down there, nothing to do. I was suffering pretty bad. And the Da Vinci Code kept sliding under the door one day. Someone sent me a book and I needed that damn book at that time. I was so happy about it. And perhaps my perception of how great a book it is was kind of part of the situation I was in at the time. But I know that I really fucking enjoyed that book. I, I stayed up for the whole night reading it and then I finished it the next day. Have you seen the movie? 
I don't think that I have seen the movie. I know Tom Hanks was in it, and it was a pretty successful movie. Yeah, yeah, it, it was. I, I read the book, and I saw the movie. And, I, you know, I mean, the, the movie is typically never up. The movie is typically not as good as the book, of course, unless you're talking about, um, well, that's Stephen King's story, The Shining, right? I mean, I don't, I don't know. I, I don't know if you read The Shining. I don't know if you saw the Kubrick version of, of The Shining. Um, but, but that's one of the few times the Stanley Kubrick uh, vision for the Stephen King book, The Shining, was, uh, wow, that was just better than the book, in my opinion. In my opinion. Yeah, yeah. I have read the book. I haven't seen the movie. Um, I know that, that Stephen King's two prison movies have, were really great movies that some might even say were better than uh, the book. The Green Mile is one of those. Mm -hmm. um, and there was like a long short story that he read. I almost started it this morning called Rita Hayworth and the Shawshank Redemption. It's about like a 90 or 100 page story uh, that was made into the movie that many consider the greatest damn movie of all time. Hmm. And I wonder if maybe it is better than the short story because, you know, the Shawshank Redemption is not a whole novel. It's a fairly short thing. So I would have to read the short story and then rewatch the movie because it's been so long since I've seen it to make uh, that judgment. But that's a that's a scenario where where many people might say the movie was actually better than the book. Right, 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 right. So we were talking before the show started about about how you prepare to do a video about a book that you're reading. Do you, um, like for example, the book that I'm reading through right now, Stephen King on writing. Yeah. It's, um, you know, I've, I have used the dreaded yellow hi highlighter to, yeah. to, to, to just like, you know, to say Andy Hall, you should really focus in. And, you know, if you're ever gonna thumb through this book again, you should really t pay attention to these parts. Well, what do you do? Uh, well, you know, I've got to do a review on a book when I finish it. Well, I guess I don't have to. I don't review them all. If I think that there's just very little interest in the review, I, I won't do it. But um, generally speaking, I have a notebook with me and I'll jot things down that I want to remember to put in my review. Of course, when I do a review on YouTube, I actually type it all out and uh, kind of script it basically. But um, I find that it's important for me to take notes and I'll also take a pencil. Sometimes I'll, if I want to read a quote from the book, I'll put a little pencil mark in there, write the page number down on, on my notebook to go back to it that way. But I just write down different ideas as briefly as I can while I'm going so that it brings it back to me when I sit down for the review and then I can write everything out. I have to tell you, I saw your video on Dean Coots. The biography you did, <laughs> yeah, Tight. good stuff. People should, as soon as they're done watching our wonderful conversation, definitely go over to your channel and check out. If you're a Dean Koontz fan, but even if you're not a Dean Koontz fan, or if you only somewhat, I got such a better appreciation for Dean Koontz after watching that video. <laughs> you know, I put a lot of work into that thing. I did a biography on Dean Koontz. And there was a lot of like pictures and there's video of him talking and everything in it. And honestly, I wanted to do one on Stephen King that I'm working on now. That's why I bought this mic uh, so that I can sound crisp and clean on that one particular video. That was the excuse I gave myself to buy another mic. But, um, you know, Dean Kuntz was kind of like the test for that, because, of course, this the first biography I'm going to do is not going to be quite as good as the second one as I'm learning along the way. But. I thought it actually did come out pretty good, that Dean Koontz biography. It only got me three subscribers. I looked at my statistics this morning. There was a lot of work that went into that damn thing, but that was the first in what I expect will be more biographies. It will get better and better and more attention as time goes on. Interesting. So what's the most popular video you ever did? Uh, that would probably be my top five worst Stephen King books. I did that one about two years ago. It's got about 15,000 views on it, and it gets probably 30 or 40 views a day. It's still going. I did another one about Dean Koontz predicting the coronavirus in one of his books, uh, which was not true, but everyone seemed to think it was true. So I cleared it up with a video, and it's got like over 10,000 views on it now. Uh, but yeah, Stephen King seems to be a big hit for me. If Stephen King's in the title of my video, it'll do well. But the top five worst Stephen King books that I ever read was the best video I've ever done as far as uh, view count goes. Right, right. Did, did you get a lot of hate from that? 
as far as just quality of the video itself, I would say probably that damn Dean Kuntz video biography I did was probably the best one. Uh, what was the question? I'm sorry. I, I was wondering if you got a lot of hate, a lot of online hate. Oh, from hell yeah. There's hundreds of comments in the, in the chat. And a lot of people actually agreed with me. You know, when it comes to art, it seems like people like to criticize one another about what they like to read or whatever. But, you know, when it comes to art, two people can see it differently, whether it's a portrait or a movie or a novel. And I think that's one of the greatest things about artwork is that we see things in different ways. And you can even see something in a piece of art, be it a song or, or a novel, that wasn't even intended by the author, right? And that's one of the most important things about art. Uh, I forget why I'm even mentioning this, but uh, I forget what the original thought we're, was. We were just here. talking about online hate regarding... Um, oh, yeah. Know, People thinking TV. that... Uh, my opinions of the books were ridiculous, but you know, their comments generate more activity. So more power to them. That's, that's right. You know, we're um, heading down towards um, the hour and you know, YouTuber, you're a YouTuber. You've been doing this for a while. What would you suggest to new YouTubers or maybe to YouTubers who have been around for a while, but do you have any hacks? Do you have any secrets? I'm not asking you to give away all of your secrets, but do you have any tips for uh, new people? Yeah, you know, I started my my uh, book review channel with my phone. I was recording in vertical mode. It was pretty terrible. Over the period of, of time, I've gotten better with what I'm I'm doing. If you went back and looked at the first few videos I did, they would be pretty bad. But, um, you know, I find a lot of value in a webcam. I'm actually thinking instead of buying a, like a nice seven, eight hundred thousand, twelve hundred dollar camera, just getting a webcam that shoots in 4K because they're like very versatile. I find the webcams can do a whole hell of a lot. I've never shot anything on on anything other than a webcam or my phone. You can actually just do a lot with your phone, but I find that writing things out ahead of time because I used to just go on the fly with a book. I might have a few things written down that I wanted to go with. Um, and I would record and then I'd try to do a little bit of editing, but I actually like to script things out, whether you're reading with a teleprompter or not, like I'm not, because I'm actually just clipping things together. I'll record for 15 or 20 seconds where I'm saying a few sentences that I've looked on the page. I know what I've got to say. Then I'll just stop. I'll start the camera, talk for a few sentences, stop it, put the video up, start it again, talk for a few sentences. If I fuck it up, I'll just delete that one. The next time I get it right, I put up and I'll have a series of videos that I will then clip together. And I find that it works well. I, I would just highly recommend writing things down and working through it to see exactly what you want to say. Uh, that seems to work well for me anyway. Cool. So, um, and I know that that wouldn't work well for everyone because people are doing different things. Um, but even if you wouldn't want to do, like I just said, if you, write things out. I find it's better than not doing so. That makes perfect sense. Dr. Osiris from the uh, chat says, I've just got several cameras and other streaming stuff off Amazon Vine Voice. Um, yeah. Once I can afford a laptop, I'm going to do something with it all. Very good. Yeah. You know, I guess one more thing that I might say, uh, I found that the laptop that I bought has been a huge, huge, uh, boost to what I'm capable of doing because I actually brought a, bought a pretty good laptop. It's a Core i7 10th Gen, 20 gigabytes of RAM. And I can have my editing program open and have some other shit going on. And I'm searching the internet and all this different shit's going on at the same time. And there's never any problem. There's never any problem. Things are like, boom, 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 boom. So I would recommend in acquiring, if you can, save up over time. Rather than buying an i laptop or desktop because you got three or 400 bucks saved up. I just say, give it some time because that good, fast quality computer is going to be essential. If you ever start to do a very sophisticated material. Good point. Good point. So John, um, this is my last question. Sure. Is there something you wanted me to ask you, but I didn't, was there <laughs> a topic you wanted to touch on, but we just didn't get around to, and we're not talking about plugs or where people can find you online. We'll do that afterwards. But was there something you wanted to, to wax philosophic about? Uh, not per se, but I did think that you might mention what you thought of Stephen King Salem's lot. Oh my God. Salem's lot. So, 
Um, what I find interesting is that sometimes artists understand what they're doing, right? What they're writing about. And sometimes they don't understand what they're writing about. Um, re just reading through his memoir, it wasn't until maybe years later that he realized that that The Shining was autobiographical because he was writing about a person because he was an active addict at the time. Yeah, um, he was talking about someone who had alcohol issues, who was once a school teacher, and it just came upon him as an epiphany, basically. Uh, that, yeah. Oh, that I was writing about myself. Now with Salem's Lot, there was much more of a awareness I feel when he was writing that because it's about a man trying to. Uh, put to rest his childhood demons to, to yeah. a broad extent, to a broad extent, uh, because he actually writes about that in, you know, there's like a couple of lines in there and there's a young, and there's a child in the book, which, you know, the main character gets to protect and mentor, which, you know, it's not a, it's not, you don't have to be a genius to figure out. It's about him kind of comforting and nourishing his younger self. So that alone is worth the price of admission. I'm a big vampire fan. Yeah. Um, and I thought that it was a, uh, a very good way of, of talking about vampires and talking about people in general in dealing with the undead, I guess, right? Um, people make horrible decisions, stupid decisions, but in the age of COVID, everything just, I say, I'm much more forgiving about characters' poor decisions now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, so it's. Uh, I saw the miniseries. I think the miniseries um, is streaming all together because it was a TV miniseries, I think, in the late 70s, maybe the early 80s. And I think it's on Amazon Prime. And so the whole thing is about two hours long. But it was a TV miniseries back in the day. Yeah. And, you know, the miniseries was pretty decent, you know, um, pretty faithful rendition of the story. But yeah, man, Salem's Lot. I, I've read it uh, more than once. And I definitely recommend it because it's basically vampire comes to a small main town and disaster occurs. Yeah. It's been a long time since I read it. Uh, ben Mears comes back to Maine after a while away. Like you said, he's looking for some healing coming back to the old stomping ground. And uh, there's some weird people that have moved into the town. They've got that house up there. It's the guy with his like assistant Straker and, and, and I, I can't remember what their names are, but <clears throat> the one, one thing that, that stands out for me with that was that the vampires were like real bloodthirsty killers in that book. Yeah. And, and, and some vampire fiction, they're, they're not that way, but that's the way that I prefer them. Um, me you too. know, I will say that I actually like, interview with the vampire better than Salem's Lot. But uh, I think that Salem's Lot is a good book. And of course, we're in Maine again, which is important uh, with Stephen King. But I will say that those vampires were very ruthless killers in that book. And, yeah. and I thought that was one of the best parts. Yeah, true enough. You know, I'll tell you one of the best short stories yeah. I ever um, read about vampires was by uh, Bradbury, Ray Bradbury. And yeah. it's in one of my short story compendiums about vampires I have kicking around back there. But I thought, wow, he, he uses the formula, the short story formula exceptionally well. And yeah. it's got vampires in it. And I thought, wow, great stuff. Yeah. Ray Bradbury uh, was good. You know, he's one of the, the, the great classic. So hopefully I can call him a classic according to that guy that chewed me out the other day about, uh, right calling uh, science fiction classics classics when they're not really classics. But, you know, I only read one Ray uh, Bradbury book. It was Fahrenheit 451, and yeah. I thought it was actually a pretty damn good book. So I'd like to read some more by him as well. Yeah, yeah, true enough, true enough. Well, dude, this has been a lot of fun. It's always fun talking to you. I wanted to get you on to talk about books and about your channel. Sure. Um, but where can people find you online? So uh, you can join me on YouTube. If you have any interest in literature, uh, join me on Reading Funk on YouTube here. Check out my channel. Uh, leave me a comment if you think I can do something better. If you'd like to see something, you know, I'm going to be having a new series here where, um, where I'm going to be starting a video out saying, uh, today's question asked me if I could take a look at this book. 
Uh, mm -hmm. You know, Dr. Todd Grande does that. He'll say, today's question asks if I can take a look at the psychological profile of Ed Gein. And then he goes on to talk about Ed Gein for 10 minutes. I'm going to start doing the same thing with books where I uh, take suggestions from the comments and and work through uh, books that my uh, my fans, uh, my viewers uh, like to see me read. So check me out there, Reading Funk on YouTube. You know, I think that we could just do a whole hour talking about Todd. About Todd Grant and your channel. <laughs> yeah, he's great. We we could just spend like a whole another hour talking about that, but we're not going to do that. Everyone in the chat, thanks for showing up. Thanks for contributing. This has been a lot of fun. John Funk, brother, thanks for coming on. Always great talking with you. Thank you uh, for having me on. I was really looking forward to it, uh, and it went well. Yeah, yeah. It didn't suck. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Take care, everyone. And it's a lot.